This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. The family of Scotland's First Minister, Hamza Youssef, have just been allowed out. Rishi Sunak says pro-Palestine protests planned for Armistice Day are provocative and disrespectful. The Prime Minister has asked the Home Secretary to support the Met Police to protect the sanctity of the day as well as Remembrance Sunday. The Security Minister, Tom Tugendhat, has told Talk TV it's about trying to find a balance. What we need to do is need to make sure that we're protecting all communities inside the United Kingdom and we put extra resource into doing just that and we've supported the Community Security Trust uh, for the Jewish community and we're supporting uh, different individuals across other areas as well. A shopping centre security officer is set to stand trial in June next year, accused of an alleged plot to kidnap and murder former This Morning presenter Holly Willoughby. Gavin Plum from Harlow in Essex has denied any involvement. The 36-year-old is also accused of encouraging another person to travel to the UK to carry out the attack. More than 70 flood warnings are still in place across England and 220 flood alerts in the aftermath of Storm Kieran. The south coast and the Channel Islands were battered with heavy rain and gusts of up to 100 miles an hour yesterday and the extreme weather is now moving to Scotland and parts of northern England. And emergency crews in Scotland have reported a rise in attacks in the lead-up to bonfire night. Firefighters are warning people that they'll take a zero-tolerance approach to dangerous and unacceptable behaviour this weekend after they were bombarded with fireworks, bricks and bottles. Well, that's the latest. Now we'll have another, we'll ha now we'll have another update for you in an hour's time. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Well, a very good afternoon. Peter Cardwell here with you between now and five o'clock. Thank you so much for your company, whether you're watching on Talk TV or listening on Talk Radio. And don't forget you can toggle between the two if you're listening on the radio and you're uh, perhaps heading home soon. You're perhaps on the drive home day off early on Friday. You can switch on the telly, Sky 522, Virgin 606, Freeview 237, Freesat 217 or via YouTube or the Talk TV app. And perhaps you're watching on the telly, maybe you're heading out to pick up the kids from school, switch on the radio to uh, Talk Radio or put it on your smart speaker. However you're interacting with us, it's wonderful to have your company and thank you for it. Uh, there's lots to discuss today because coming up there is outrage as pro-Palestinian activists are set to march through the streets of London at the same time as the Festival of Remembrance is being held at the Royal Albert Hall next week on Remembrance Day. Protesters have descended on the capital in support of Palestine over the past three Saturdays and that is going to continue on the 11th of November, Remembrance Day. In the last few hours, the Prime Minister has condemned the march, calling it provocative. Is he right or should we allow the protest to go ahead? 
Also this afternoon, tensions continue to rise in the Middle East as the leader of the terrorist group Hezbollah has said they are in a true battle with Israel and he is ready for all possibilities. He also says Hamas attacks on the 7th of October were a, as he puts it, glorious jihadi operation. How about murderous terrorist campaign? I think that's probably how I would describe it. With the US Secretary of State Anthony Blinken in Tel Aviv, are we on the verge of all-out war in the Middle East? More on that with the former Defence and indeed Foreign Minister Tobias Elwood next. And are you tired after a long week of work? Well, fear not, your job could soon be taken over by artificial intelligence bots. Elon Musk made the sinister claim during a cosy fireside chat with David Letterman. I'm sorry, not actually David Letterman, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Do you fear technology is coming for your job? Let us know your thoughts on any of those topics. The numbers 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. You can also text me on 87222. Be sure to put the word talk in your text or you can uh, tweet me at Talk TV or follow me at Peter Cardwell. Let's spend the next couple of hours together here on Talk TV because there's so much to discuss. The This pro-Palestine rally set to go ahead on Remembrance Day the 11th of November and actually Remembrance Sunday is the 12th uh, which which is the next day so it's really a, a, a weekend when we should be thinking about the people who uh, who liberated us from the Nazis those in World War One as well but then again I suppose maybe you might think this is actually the point the point is that people have the right for free assembly and free speech uh, it's a very very interesting one uh, let's find out what Tobias Elwood thinks he's a for, for, former um, foreign office minister we'll get to him in a second um, but there's uh, certainly lots to talk about with him because Hezbollah says the October 7 attacks on Israel were a glory, glorious jihadi operation as he denied any rule in its planning. Um, there's lots to get through with him. What are your thoughts on this too? 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. Kenny in Edinburgh says, I've got four words for Rishi Sunak and his opinion on pro-Palestine demonstrators. We told you so, uh, which is an interesting one. What do you think about this? I just think it's a really interesting one because there are, I want freedom of speech, I want freedom of assembly, and if things are legal, even if I disagree with them, I certainly would not be on a pro-Palestine march, and I certainly would not be doing anything that uh, supports what Hamas are doing. Not that those people, all of them on that march, are doing that, but we have seen people shouting jihadi, we've seen the Metropolitan Police not, uh, not um, uh, arresting them for saying such things. Well, let's find out what Tobias Elwood thinks. He's a for former Foreign Office Minister and a for former Defence uh, Minister as well. Tobias, you're very welcome to Talk TV. Uh, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Tobias. I just wonder what you think about the fact that this rally is set to go ahead on the 11th of November. A lot of people will find that very offensive. How do you, as someone who has served in the military and has served in both the Defence and Foreign Office, um, feel about this? Yes, I'm glad we're talking about this now and not the, you know, the, the, the day before as such. This is so important that uh, those organising this recognise the mood of the nation, which is led, I think, by the Prime Minister, who said this would be provocative and indeed disrespectful. And I'm pleased to see the Security Minister, my friend Tom Tugendhat, has actually been in touch with the Met Police, the Mayor of London, and indeed Westminster Council to make sure that they prevent uh, any licensing of any protests, but be ready to, to make sure that they don't happen. I, I mean, just stepping back for a second, we should just reflect that Re Remembrance Day itself is when the nation pauses to reflect on past sacrifices, on those who have served to defend our freedoms, uh, our way of life, if you like. Um, and we come together right across uh, the whole of the United Kingdom, every village, every town, city, as well as in the, in the capital and the cenotaph. So it's an opportunity to say thank you to our armed forces for those who have served and those who are serving. It's an apolitical event. I think that's the most important thing. It reaches across all faiths, all cultures and all backgrounds. And it would be highly inappropriate for any form of demonstration, uh, pro-Palestinian or whatever, to as a national demonstration to overshadow what the nation does when and, it and comes I think, together. I think you're right, Tobias. I think, I think it would. Reflection. I think it would overshadow it. And I suppose there are many questions regarding just what you, you've said. I suppose the first one I want to ask is, do you have faith in the Metropolitan Police to police it correctly if it does go ahead? Because clearly the, there are other parts of these marches on Saturday that have got out of hand, that arrests perhaps haven't been made that should have been made. Maybe they were made later. And of course, we need to be careful about that. But certainly it seems to me that a lot of people's faith in the Metropolitan Police to police these uh, big marches is not high at the moment. And if things were to step up a notch, if emotions were to run even higher than they are at the moment because it were to be Remembrance Day, well, 
how much faith do you have in the Metropolitan Police to do their job and to catch anybody who is inciting racial hatred, for example, who is supporting a prescribed terrorist organisation, Hamas? Yeah, I mean, you covered so many important issues there. What the police have done to date, dealing with the un unfolding crisis uh, in the Middle East, whether they should have been stronger in plucking out those people who are chanting uh, jihadi comments and so forth, that clearly uh, is an incitement uh, to violence. And that begs the question as to the fact that there are these agitators that are trying to sow tensions, stoke unrest, uh, and uh, taking away from perhaps the passive message uh, that most you know, pro-Palestinian rallies would want to procure. They're trying to blur the difference between what the ordinary Palestinians perhaps might be searching for and supporting Hamas after those barbaric attacks uh, on the 7th of October. And, and when you try and blur the two together, that gets you into a very, very dangerous place uh, indeed with a real prospect of uh, escalation. I do have faith given, as I say, we've got number of hours and days, in fact, to make sure that we get the assets in place, the operational aspects of this, this right. But ultimately, the fact that you and I, we're talking about this mm. now, the Prime Minister has made comment too. I do hope those who are organizing this re recognize what damage they would be doing to whatever cause they may be yeah. pursuing. Yeah when they challenge and, and trying to overshadow what is such an important date and, and any sympathies, the, and Tobias, I, I totally agree with you, and any sympathies that people may be having for uh, ordinary civilians in, in uh, the Palestinian territory, certainly in Gaza, that, that is something that I worry about, the innocent civilians and all of this, but it will be conflated and it will certainly be, be put together. I wonder as well, uh, within this actually, just thinking about this issue, that, I mean, I was at Labour Party conference up in Liverpool and literally uh, two days after after those 7th of October attacks on the Monday, there are people talking about you know Israel genocide and all the kind of things that they allege against the Israeli state. And I thought, is this really the day? That was outside the secure zone, I should be, be totally clear in saying. And I just think that there are you know, it, it's the one. It's one of the few times of the year. Yes, we're we're, we're wearing poppies today and on this in this season of remembrance. But it really is one or two days a year, a few minutes actually, when you think about the the uh, eleven o'clock on the Sunday, where we really remember those who have given their lives. But I, I basically agree with what you're saying, Tobias. But let me play devil's advocate for a second, because some might argue. Obviously, we want people to stay within the law. We don't want them to incite any hatred against anybody. We don't want them to incite violent acts or support a, a terrorist uh, organization which is Hamas, a prescribed organisation. But some people might say, well, actually, the people who fought and died for our country fought for the freedom to have peaceful assembly, to, ha to disagree, actually, and to have uh, views and to express those views very publicly that perhaps the government or most people would disagree with. So from a freedom of speech, freedom of assembly side of things, I, I mean, I agree with you on the sensitivities. You, you would think just that day, just, just, just stay at home. But actually, is there a wider argument here about those other issues which people fought and died for, Tobias? Yeah, I mean, there's such valid points that you make. I think the underlying message here, though, is that, of course, we fought for those rights, for democratic rights, for values, for transparency and openness. But in today's day and age, particularly with what's going on in the Middle East as well, mm. what you say in public uh, counts if you incite violence, using those words, then you are actually taking advantage and abusing the very freedoms that those people uh, in armed uniform, you know, who's made the ultimate sacrifice for to defend. You are taking advantage and, and exploiting um, that uh, that right for the freedom of, of speech. And that's what we're simply asking for now. I think the Prime Minister has led the chorus of concern here to say uh, that respect what goes on on this important Sunday of ours. And that doesn't take away from your right to express your views. But if it's going to lead to clashes, if it's going to lead to potential escalation, and it's going to lead for challenges to our British forces, British police officers mm. and so forth, then you should really be thinking twice about what you're doing. Totally agree. Let's bring this back to what is actually happening in the Middle East, on which I know you're an expert, your former Middle East minister. Uh, the Hezbollah leader, Hassan Nasrallah, spoke a bit earlier. Let's just hear what he had to say. Uh, to, there are two, more than two million people that are living in a, a very small area and they have very hard life. They are killing our people daily basis and the 
resting on daily basis. There, are, there is not no one in this world to ask. No, no Uni United Nations, no Security Council, no Arab League, no European Union. I mean, that's basically a rant there by Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, in his uh, safe and uh, secure uh, place where he lives, which is probably in Qatar. Um, I mean, do you take anything he says seriously? Some of the stuff he's saying, uh, Tobias, about a glorious jihadi operation, I'd call it a, a murderous terrorist campaign. Um, the true battle with Israel, he says, is ready for all possibilities. Um, obviously, Hezbollah, if they were to get involved, that would be a very, very different thing and a much wider thing. Just give us your assessment of that situation, Tobias. I mean, you know, firstly, just listening to him speak about those international organizations that are usually the ones that step in to, as custodians of international peace and security. Well, he's ignored them all. Yeah. You know, he's been bankrolled by Iran, along with the Houthis uh, in, in Yemen and Hamas as well, with the specific task of trying to destroy a nation state. So bizarre that he then calls on these other organizations for some support. Uh, you know, he is a non-state actor in another country and his weapon systems at his disposal are far more superior to Hamas. And that is perhaps the concern I have. And I choose my words very, very carefully. It's absolutely right that there is general Western support for Israel to defend itself after those barbaric attacks on the 7th of October that we saw. Hamas has lost any claim to lead Gaza and, and absolutely should be destroyed in the way that ISIS was and, and, and Al-Qaeda and so forth. But, is that realistic? Can, I, can that actually happen? Is that possible? Well, I think it is possible, but this is, again, where, you know, I stray into difficult terrain. And I say this as somebody, as you introduced me as a Middle East minister, but also as a former uh, military tactician. Yeah. The Israeli military tactics deployed since the 7th of October, I think, have been politically influenced because there was a need to actually respond immediately. But there is an absence of clear strategy of what follows. And that, I'm afraid, is leading to escalation with the potential of Hezbollah likely to be drawn yeah. in. And, you know, this is what we need to make clear is that Israel is not alone in this. If we are to defeat the ideology, not just the Hamas individuals and the leaders, but the ideology and prevent Hamas 2.0, then it will take neighboring Arab involvement, those who, who signed the Abrahamic Accords, it will take Western involvement as well. And these are the questions that need to be asked about, about future governance, future mm -hmm. security, humanitarian support, what is the transition plan and so on. All these need to be discussed, I think, as an emergency summit by international leaders. We cannot just watch this unfold, yeah. potentially escalating, not just in a Middle East conflict, but beyond as well. The ability for the West to manage so many different challenges across the world it is part is of being that, truly tested. I think, you know, if Israel wanted to destroy uh, the Gaza Strip, they could drop a nuclear bomb on it. I really, really hope they don't do that, and I'm sure that hasn't been even discussed. But actually, is part of this saying to Israel, we know you want to go all out. We know that Netanyahu has talked about, you know, a, a campaign you can't even imagine in terms of its ferocity. Is Does the West need to slightly restrain Israel and say this has to be proportionate? Is that part of the argument? Or is that just, uh, should we just allow them to get on with it? No, I, 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 it, it's absolutely what you're saying. It's not just uh, be, be proportionate. And it's also let's help. Let's actually work on this together. Because only, as I say, uh, with some... Who's going to do the governance in uh, the Gaza Strip after this has all happened? It, there's no doubt. There's nobody questioning Israelis' military might. But, you know, no uh, conflict ends with a, a military solution. There has to be a political one. Yeah. And at the moment, what's happening is going back to Hamas and the ordinary Palestinian people... What is the sell to the Palestinians, ordinary Palestinians, of what their future is? And it, we need to sell this in a way that says they themselves, too, want to get rid of Hamas. Right now, nobody's really clear as to where this is going, yes. what the ultimate yes. objective is. That's where the West needs to come in. And I'm pleased that James Cleverly and, and, and now Anthony Blinken, back in the region, I'm sure the back channels are working very, very hard indeed having these very yes. same discussions. Tobias, thank you very, very much indeed. Tobias Elwood MP there, for, former Foreign Office Minister, former Chair of the Defence Select Committee, former Defence Minister, former uh, soldier himself. Uh, Mick has been in touch on text to say, our weak, woke police and authorities protect the right to protest, but not the rights of the law-abiding majority who live in fear while they have the luxury of expensive protection. Enough, says Mick. Uh, Tony in Yorkshire. Hi, Peter, I will be in York on the 12th of November for their commemorations. York was a bad, has a bad history of how it treated its Jews, and I hope my fellow Jewish veterans will be 
respected not only here but throughout the UK. Well, Tony, absolutely, uh, you have my respect um, for both your Judaism and indeed your service to this country. Keith is in London. On Remembrance Day, Keith, what do you make of this uh, plan for a pro-Palestinian march through your own city, through London, Keith? You're very welcome to the programme. Hello, uh, hello. Sorry, not Ian, uh, Peter. Um, yes, um, I served in the Air Force for twelve years, and I'm actually in favour of this demonstration because they should be commemorating all war dead, including the dead in this current war. All the civilians that have died in both Israel and in Gaza should all be commemorated on Remembrance Day. Do you not think that there's the there's the, uh, the the risk perhaps that there might be some people who want to uh, perhaps remember dead Hamas Hamas terrorists themselves? Would that not creep into this? Um, yeah, I guess so. But um, what did we do in 1948? I mean, the the um, the British forces were were in Palestine in 1948 when they set up the State of Israel. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's older than uh, longer ago than I was born, but only by about 10 years. I, I say I served in the armed forces during several, I served during the Falklands War, I served during the First Gulf War and several other conflicts. And I think we should be commemorating all war dead, not just the, 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 those who died in the Second World War, the First World War, and then... So do you, do you, can, I, can I just ask you as a veteran then, if you're saying all the war dead, are you? I don't. I don't mean to be unnecessarily provocative here, but I. I just want just with your logic here, Keith. Are you then remembering those who died on the German side in the Second World War, for um, example? Well, I served in Germany for three years of my twelve years in service in the air force. And what about all the German civilians that were killed during the Dambusters and Dresden I, I, and I, 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 I totally agree with you, but we're not commemorating dead Nazis. No, no, not the Nazis, but we should be commemorate should, should be commemorating the those who died in Dresden and in the Dunbusters raids and in Hamburg. It's, um, it's an awful lot of the, the Royal Air Force bombing in the Second World War was did kill civilians. Yeah, yeah, well, there's no doubt about that, Keith. That's a really interesting perspective. I'm not sure I entirely agree, but I, I like, I, I like that you phoned us and and that you've said that. So thank you very, very much indeed. That's Keith in London there. Thank you to him. Um, we're going to move on and move to a break now, but we're going to talk to Alex Crowley, former Downing Street advisor, about all these stories about this pro-Palestinian rally, about Hezbollah and about Zara Alina's killer, Jordan McSweeney, winning his sentencing appeal. That's coming up next. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah! <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? <laughs> I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am Sands. not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the Preservation of the Habitat of the Lesser Spotted New. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. 
There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Brave as here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after this <laughs> show. <laughs> Kevin, right. Mark. Uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV, sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, yeah. <laughs> Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. Well, thank you so much for your company today. Uh, Peter Cardwell here between now and five o'clock. Lots of people getting in touch on text. Already a few tweets in a minute as well. Paul in Essex says, the problem with these pro-Palestine marches is that they are not protests, they are rallies calling for a war on our way of life and cultures in the West. Paul, I'm going to respectfully disagree with you. There are tens of thousands of people on these marches, and that's not what they're all saying. We just need to be careful about that. There are some people, absolutely, 100%, who are calling for jihad, who are calling for, uh, you know, pro-Hamas and all the rest, but there's no doubt about that. But there are people who just are just pro-Palestine on these marches, and that's... I mean, it's, I, I, I would not be in the march myself, but we need to be careful about that. Anyway, Paul continues and says, the government have been spineless. They need to wake up and take action before blood is spilt on our streets. Chris and Bexel says, why don't these pro-Palestinian protesters uh, support Hamas by leaving the safety of the U UK and going to Gaza? Uh, Sarah says, who's an RAF veteran in West Sussex, says, Peter, as you know, I am a veteran. I believe in free speech. That is what my service was for. The Prime Minister is dependent on the Mayor of London. The uh, MPS, Metropolitan Police Service, has not uh, showered itself in glory, far from it. The solution appears to be uh, to reroute the protests away from Whitehall. Those protesting uh, range from the uh, woefully naive virtue signallers to the overt supporters of Hamas, a prescribed terrorist organisation. Final one from Jane, who says, Hi Peter, it was always going to come back to this regarding the protest on those days. Parliament is back next week. This must be discussed because many people are very worried about this. And just before I go to Alex Crowley, I just want to read out the statement, very short statement from Rishi Sunak, uh, the Prime Minister, and it is uh, I think we can see it on the screen in a second. It's just a couple of paragraphs. He says, The planned protest on Armistice Day is provocative and disrespectful, says Rishi Sunak, uh, and there is a clear and present risk that the Cenotaph and other war memorials could be desecrated, something that would be an affront to the British public and the values we stand for. The right to remember, the Prime Minister says, in peace and dignity, those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice for those freedoms must be protected. I've asked the Home Secretary to support the Metropolitan Police in doing everything necessary to protect the sanctity of Armistice Day and Remembrance Sunday. Well, let's speak to Alex Crowley, who's a former Downing Street advisor. Um, Alex, you're very welcome to the programme this afternoon. How are you? Hello, very well, thank you, Peter. What do you make of this and the fact that there will be a pro-Palestinian protest on Remembrance Day, on the 11th of November itself? Uh, well, I think I think it's pretty appalling, really, and I think the, the words you've just read out from Prime Minister are absolutely correct. He is completely right. Uh, Remembrance Day mm. is a sacred event. Yeah. It is... Over, uh, overall, this is meant to be a peaceful event. It is meant to be a time for reflection, for calm, for remembrance. And having, frankly, a, a protest on pretty much any issue, uh, uh, you know, not just because it's the, the, the Palestine-Israel issue, but having any kind of protest disturbing that, I don't think is correct. Um, and I think he's absolutely right. There is a risk to the desecration of war memorials. We have already seen this in the previous protests. Um, when are we going to um, get to grips with the fact that we now apparently, are we meant to have a protest every weekend? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, from they, a, they, a they, they basically made their, I mean, this is an ongoing uh, war-like situation, not quite a war yet. But they've made their point, haven't they? I don't think there's, I don't think there's anybody 
sitting at home watching those protests, he doesn't know what those protesters think. There's a, there are a range of opinions. Some of them are totally peaceful. Um, we talk, heard about naive virtue signalers, for example. I'm sure there are people who aren't naive. I'm sure there are people who aren't virtue signalers who are on those protests. And then on the other side of that, on the, the extreme, we have seen people calling for jihad. We have call, seen people uh, doing horrific things to mocked up dead babies, bouncing them on a, on a Palestinian flag and all the rest of it. Absolutely horrendous stuff. But I don't think there's anybody in the country who doesn't know what the protests are about and what they have been about for the last three weeks, if you follow the news at all. So exactly. th that's, a, that's a very very reasonable question, Alex. Why actually hold another one to make exactly the same point as you made when, uh, there, is we, a, we... when there is a sacred day within this country? Quite. So um, now, are we, are we supposed to have one every weekend now? Is that how it's going to be? for the potentially weeks and months that the that the troubles are going to be going on in israel do, do we is that it now we have to we have to put up with this every weekend um what i want to know is what are the authorities doing to 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 protect jewish londoners and to stop them feeling intimidated. Yeah. Well, it's not because just Jewish Londoners, Alex. There's other people as well who I know. Look, London is the capital city, and, and it's very important. We, but there are also people right across the country who are sometimes very worried about these and very worried about perhaps going into London, maybe even going to other yeah. places where protests might be might be held and so on. And there are people who, rightly or wrongly, feel very intimidated by these protests. Well, and, and, and yes, you would be intimidated, wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh, given some of the things that we have seen, and you're right, they're not just directed at Jewish Londoners, but, uh, you know, young families, for example, who, who might have come into central London for what they thought was a nice day out, and suddenly they get wrapped up in all of that. Now, look, we, we take our, our values in this country of allowing peaceful protests and all the rest of it very, very seriously, and they're great values to have, but... Honestly, some of the things that, are, that have been going on over the last couple of weekends, and this is in response, let us never forget, to a, a horrific terrorist attack, um, murdering some 300 people in the most awful ways you could possibly imagine. Um, where are the memorials and protests for those victims? That, that, that yeah. I think, is what we need to see. And what about, I mean, you've been in Downing Street, you've been an advisor there. What conversations will be going on behind the scenes? Will Rishi Sunak be thinking, should I ban this? Is that possible? Is that something he can do? Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying you're, you're, I'm not putting you on the spot and saying you're a, a legal expert on, on freedom of assembly, Alex, but surely there will be some sort of uh, at least security discussions in terms of whether this should go ahead or not, whether that, this is the right thing to do, especially on such a sacred day. I think that, that I think those discussions will be going on. I think the fact that the Prime Minister has put out such a strong statement is, 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 is very, very noteworthy. Uh, I worry that we are falling into a position where uh, the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister, who, who ultimately do have the power to stop this if they really want yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now you it's can just whether that actually causes problem. even more of a problem, Alex. Well, but the point, what I, what I find worrying is they're putting out statements that are in effect saying they think it should be banned. Mm. But who are they calling to ban it? They are the people that can yes. ban it. I love this when politicians do this. They say, I'm campaigning for this to happen. It's like, you're the government. You're the ones who can make the decision. Uh, very, very... Like yeah, Rishi Sunak could ban it tomorrow. Uh, yeah. He could ban it now. He could, ban it. he could say, right now, I'm banning it. Very, uh, yeah, very, very so, interesting. So, so, why, so why isn't he then? If, if he's put out such a strong statement, and I agree with every single word of it, and I'm sure a lot of people will, why isn't he exercising his power? Say something about how our system is perhaps not, not working in, in, mm. in, in, in quite the right way. Very, very interesting um, couple of messages coming in here. Uh, Stug on Twitter says, Peter, this Palestine protest march is just that, a loud, aggressive mob with questionable morality trying to stop Hamas getting the war it caused. It is in no way similar to the Remembrance Day gathering to mourn our relatives and remember the sacrifice they made. Not the same. Totally agree with that. Uh, Les on Twitter says, as regard the timing and route of the London protest march, the Northern Irish are experts in this area. Surely you have the answer, Peter. How about drafting in the Northern Ireland Police Service with their Land Rovers and helmets? Um, well, that's the question about the Metropolitan Police as well. Nicholas says, one could be perverse and say, let them trash the weekend, let them run riot and let the world see what successive governments have allowed and done in the peace 
to post-war Britain. Shame the politicians. Churchill must be turning in his grave. Interesting one from Alicia as well. He says, it's my birthday on the 11th of November. Happy birthday to you, Alicia, for that day. If someone spoils the remembrance service, I will tell my father. As a Christian, I went to Israel in 2009. I was there on my birthday, November the 11th. We saw Jerusalem, which is a beautiful city with people living together from different cultures and faiths in peace. God bless you, says Alicia. Um, so there, there are a range of perspectives on this. I wonder just in regard to Hezbollah and what their leader uh, has said. Um, he is talking about a glorious jihadi operation on October the 7th. He's denied any rule in its planning, says it's Hamas who did it. I, I would say a murderous terrorist campaign rather than glorious jihadi operation. I mean, can we take anything he says seriously? I, I think there were a lot of people worrying as well, Alex, that he was going to call for uh, all-out war on Hezbollah to get involved in, uh, in Gaza. Yeah, well, first of all, it's completely disgusting that he would celebrate such an, such, such an awful terrorist. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, and, and sadly, a lot of the people involved in the protest that we've just been talking about uh, appear to take a similar view. Yeah. Uh, and that is the problem with those protests. Uh, as to what, you know, can, can we take what he says ser uh, you know, seriously? Can we, can we take any truth in it? Um, I don't know. I wouldn't put my mortgage on the guy. I don't know about you. Um, yeah. you know, uh, I, think, I think that's a very fair assessment, Alex. There's just two quick things I want to ask you about. Um, Zara Alina's killer, this was the woman who yeah. was uh, sexually assaulted and murdered, absolutely horrendous. Her killer, yeah. Jordan Sweeney, has won a sentence appeal. Uh, Alex, um, some of the detail in this is just absolutely uh, disgusting. What do you make of what has happened? He was meant to go to prison for many, many decades. And, uh, he, I mean, he didn't even turn up for a sentencing originally. And uh, that, uh, he, his, uh, his, the, the time that he has to serve in prison has been reduced. Well, it, what, what appears to have taken place here is, is a, a fairly sort of minor legal argument about whether he, you know, whether he got 36 years or 33 years. Now, hopefully, in practice, it doesn't make much difference. He will be behind bars for a very, very long time. Yeah. Uh, there's two things here. One, I think we need to see the sentence. Uh, you know, we need to see the remarks of the justices that have made this decision and their reasoning for it. We need to understand a bit more about that. And secondly, I'm just drawn to what the original sentencing judge said in 2022 about, about this man. He said that the defendant is a pugnacious and deeply violent man with a propensity to, vi uh, propensity to violence. Um, uh, the, the, the incident involving the victim, it was a steep and sudden escalation of violence which had simmered in his life for many years. Yeah, that he should, he, should, he, should he should never have been out in prison for the... Uh, for, uh, uh, he'd never been out of prison life. in the first place. He was released on licence uh, having been jailed from robbery. It's absolutely uh, horrendous. Terry and Ramsbottom says he broke the conditions of parole. He should serve the rest of his life sentence. To agree yeah. with that. Um, on, on the political side of things, I want to go to a caller in just a second, Alex, but just briefly, Nadine Dorries is on the front page of the, uh, of the Daily Mail. I know her show is coming up later on this station Friday night with Nadine, and you'll want, definitely want to tune into that. Uh, but, yeah. I mean, so what, what she's alleging against this mysterious Dr. No character, the shadowy figure behind the scenes in Downing Street, uh, alleging that that he sort of cut up somebody's pet rabbit. I mean, it, it, and served time in prison for arson. I mean, and, and this is one of the most powerful people in the country, but we, we don't quite know who it is because she said it's, it's Dr. No, and she's given him this, this, uh, this title. I mean, that, that, those are pretty strong allegations and I know that the Daily Mail is going to be serialising her book it's it, it's it's kind of bizarre it's very odd I mean it's um you know but you can tell she's got a book to sell I mean that that, that that's really that's quite sort of spicy stuff isn't it I mean obviously we all want to know more about that because it it sounds so unlikely and so and so ridiculous I mean who knows I mean I, I've never heard of such a character but you know um, maybe you have Peter I don't know but um uh, it's, it's, I, have, I have a fair idea. I have a fair idea who she's referring to, Alex. But um, I also I also have a mortgage and uh, don't want to be sued. I was going to say, uh, yeah, so okay. I, I don't want to be sued, and, and I have no evidence whatsoever that that person has been up to that. But it'll be very very interesting what Nadine has to say later on. Alex, thank you, Alex Crowley, there, former Downing Street advisor. Jill is in Cornwall. Wants to talk about Remembrance Day. Jill, you're very welcome to the program. Uh, what would you like to say about Remembrance Day? Uh, hello, Peter. Um, well, I, my husband's ex-military, and um, so Remembrance Day is very important to him, um, as it is to a lot of people in this country. But of I, I, must be perf I must be perfectly honest. I am getting very, very worried about the activities that are being allowed to happen in this country, and nothing is being done. 
you know, nothing. I mean, I, I know you just spoke about um, the chap who's just had his sentence reduced. I, I can understand sometimes why the police lose heart in things yeah. when, you, when you find that the justice system um, lets them down uh, when they've caught a criminal. Well, Jill, and, and Jill I, think, we... I think what you're saying is so unbelievably opposite, so true and so important and I think a lot of people feel this way. So you're, yeah. you, you've probably lived all around the world, I would imagine, following your husband yeah. around. You've made yeah. a lot of sacrifices. He's made sacrifices. I ex expect he's probably seen uh, people killed in action. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and all, all people are saying is give us a bit of a fair deal. Just put the forces of law and order and put the justice system on our side. And I think, Jill, you speak for a lot of people who don't feel that's happening. Uh, well, it isn't. It isn't. And unfortunately, we have a very, uh, what I think is a very, very weak government. I have no faith in the politicians that are running this country, running this country, for goodness sake. You wouldn't run your house like it. I, I just feel that we, there is no one that seems to have the book, oh, nearly said it. Um, it doesn't seem to have the courage, you know, <laughs> the courage to um, make a statement and follow it through. Yeah. We this, this is going to cause awful problems, especially with the fact that um, the people that will be at this parade and what have you uh, have been following it and supporting it for years, mm. years, some of them. And and this is like a, a smack in the face, as far as I'm concerned. And it, it, it won't need much to, to kick it off and turn yeah. it into something that could be absolutely dreadful, absolutely dreadful. Well, Jill, on both the 11th and the 12th of November, I'm going to be in this studio and we're going to be giving full coverage to Remembrance uh, Day and indeed Remembrance Sunday. We'll have that. And uh, Jill, I'm going to be thinking not just about my grandfather's brother, who was a navigator in the RAF and died, was shot down when he was in the RAF. I'm going to be thinking about people like you, actually, who are the women and partners of many people in the military, in the RAF, in the Navy, in the Army, who have made sacrifices themselves. So thank you, Jill, for everything that you've done, as well as your, as well as your husband. And uh, we need to remember not just the, those who are dead and have given their lives for our freedom, but also... Uh, those who are living and those who are serving and those who are helping those who serve and allowing them to serve and, and uh, people like Jill who are uh, really, really important in this country. Thanks to Matt and Ron Corn, who says, Hello Peter, great show. Any particular reason you haven't asked Alex Crowley about the evidence on the revelations made at the COVID inquiry? Um, honestly, not Matt, I slightly ran out of time. Alex was actually on talk today on the breakfast show I think on Wednesday with Nicola and uh, Jeremy so if you want to look back on talk.tv you can see what he thinks about it then but the next time he's on I'll ask him about it but honestly there are just so many other things I want to talk to him about including the uh, Festival of Remembrance uh, more on that next we're going to talk to Colonel Richard Kemp former British Army officer
going to talk to Colonel Richard Kemp in a second, the former commander of the British forces in Afghanistan, but I just want to uh, get a few a flavour of what you're saying on this remembrance issue. It really is a big one. This is, uh, just if you're just tuning in, this is the fact that a pro-Palestinian march, there have been three of them that have happened over the past three weeks in London. Well, one of them is going to happen on the 11th of November, Remembrance Day, and then the 12th, of course, is Remembrance Sunday, the next day. I'll be on air both days. In fact, I'm on tomorrow as well and Sunday between 10am and 1pm. We're going to continue to discuss this and take as many calls, texts and tweets as we can. Jane says, Hi Peter, can't the protest be diverted away from Whitehall? Surely on that weekend the security needs to be watertight. Well Jane, you're absolutely right. I think it should be anyway because the King is there and uh, we know that he'll be there and we know that uh, the Prime Minister is there and so on. Um, Peter, Remembrance Day says this texter, if it does God forbid kick off, it'll be interesting to see the BBC coverage of it and the way their reporter will be, will be watching that closely of course. Um, I replied um, earlier on to Matt as well who was asking just about um, about uh, the COVID inquiry and Alex Crowley, but yeah, do do have a look back on talk today with um, with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola uh, Thorpe. That was on Wednesday morning. Alex Crowley was on about that. I think I bumped into him. It was about 10, 10 past six in the morning, so I was half asleep. Uh, but thank you to Matt, who's been back in touch. He says thank you. Appreciate the response. Love the show. Thank you, Matt. Um, just two more. Holly says I support free speech, but why are some protests and gatherings stopped, like the pro-Israel ones that were stopped? Uh, for example, memorial ones stopped in London, but pro-Palestinian ones are allowed every weekend all over the country and on Armistice Day. Sir Max says, I'm a 23-year veteran. I do not want any protest anywhere near the Cenotaph. There are other areas to have a demo, so go there. Allow veterans to have one day of reflective peace. If there is insistence that the demo should be near the Cenotaph, then ban it. Well, let's find out what Colonel Richard Kemp, former commander of the British forces in Afghanistan, has to say about this. Um, Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. What is your reaction to this? There are a lot of people very, very annoyed about this. I wonder what your perspective is. Well, I think it's extremely important that uh, that no group, whatever their cause, however important they think it is, should in any way uh, disrupt the events of Remembrance Sunday or Armistice Day on Saturday. Uh, it, it's th These are very, very solemn commemorations of millions of British soldiers, sailors and airmen who were killed fighting for our country, fighting for our freedom. Uh, and although that does include freedom of peaceful protest, freedom of speech, it does not give them the right, does not give protesters the right, whatever their, whatever their cause, to, uh, to, to disrupt those people who want to, to pay tribute to the dead of the various world wars. And, and on Armistice Day, of course, the primary focus is on the dead of the First World War when one million British soldiers, sailors and airmen were killed. Um, we've literally just had this coming through. It's a comment by a man called Ben Jamal, who's director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, talking about weekly demonstrations. Um, our next National March for Palestine is scheduled for November the 11th. We have made clear, Mr Jamal says, that we have no intention of marching anywhere near Whitehall out of respect for events taking place at the Cenotaph. The march will be begin uh, at 12.45, nearly two hours after the two-minute silence. Given these facts, we are deeply alarmed by members of the government, including the Prime Minister, issuing statements suggesting the march is a direct threat to the Cenotaph and designed to disrupt the Remembrance Day commemorations. I mean, Mr Jamal may well feel that, but there will no doubt be some people on his march who he can't necessarily control, who may wish to perhaps not not disrupt the events as they go on but nonetheless there will be uh, wreaths there will be uh, markers there at the cenotaph and indeed in other parts of london right across the country richard that could be targets for uh, some of these people i'm not saying everyone on these marches would would do this or even think of doing this but it is the, the timing really to a lot of people is really something that could have been avoided yeah, it, 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 it's simply not necessary. Now, I don't, personally, I don't mind, not that it's up to me at all, but I don't mind when they march or where they march, as long as it does not affect um, Remembrance or Armistice Day events. And, and as you rightly say, those events don't just take place at the Cenotaph. They take place all around the country, in war memorials all around the country, many of which are in London uh, and, and other cities. Uh, so, uh, fine, I mean, I'm not going to slap Ben Jamal on the back for um, for saying he's not going to disrupt these um, these events. It's a good thing he's not going to disrupt them, but, uh, I, you know, the, we shouldn't forget what his events are, and, and, and the, these are pro-Hamas protests. The, the, the kind, Hamas being the kind of jihadist, oppressive, dictatorial organisation, murderous group, that, that many of our soldiers fought, fought against the kind, that kind of uh, regime in in 
the two world wars and other conflicts as well, including in Afghanistan and Iraq. So, uh, you know, he it's, it's not a matter, I don't think it's a matter for giving him any kind of credit for not mm. being there. This, uh, they absolutely should not uh, involve themselves in any location that could affect the uh, commemorations. Absolutely. What will be going through your mind on both Remembrance Day itself on the 11th and indeed on Remembrance Sunday the 12th. You're someone who has given a lifetime of service to this country. You've reached the, the rank of colonel and uh, you're someone who uh, commanded our forces in Afghanistan where many brave British servicemen and women lost their lives. I know, of course, the origins of Remembrance Sunday are World War One, but of course you'll be remembering so many others in so many uh, wars since then who have lost their lives. Just tell us a little bit about how you will go through the day, uh, both on the Saturday and the Sunday, Colonel Kemp. Yeah, well, of course, Armistice Day, as I, as I said, commemorates specifically the million British troops that died in the First World War. Uh, and Remembrance Sunday commemorates British and British Commonwealth troops that uh, that were killed in all, all wars. Um, and uh, one, one thing that people may not be aware of, but it's quite an important point, is that the two-minute silence we hold on both of those two days, the first minute is to remember the, the troops that were killed, and the second minute is specifically intended to remember the families of those that died who also made immense sacrifices by losing you know, a, a father, a brother, a sister. I a never son, knew that. I never knew that. That's fa that's fascinating. Yeah, and it's 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 a pretty important part of the commemoration mm -hmm. because, you know, the, as well as the dead, the dead gave everything. They, you know, these are people who who gave more than anyone else has ever given for our country. They gave their life. They gave everything they ever had, everything they would ever have. And it's really important that we do honour them in the way we do. But. But their families also, and, and particularly around the First World War era uh, and, and around that time beforehand, the families, they, they suffered immensely as a loss, as a result of the loss of, in some cases, the breadwinner of the family. Yes. There wasn't the social support systems that exist today. So they, they suffered immensely as a result of that. Um, but, you know, my, I had my great uncle was killed in the First World War. I had a, a cousin who was killed fighting in the Merchant Navy in the Second World War. I've uh, I've known several soldiers, many soldiers who have been killed fighting in my during my military service. And, uh, you know, I obviously in, in those times, in those days, I remember those who I knew or who I'm, re I'm related to. But, you know, everyone remembers it in a different way. And I think one thing that is worth mentioning is that no one forces anybody to do this. This yeah. is not a compulsory thing. And if you don't choose to wear a poppy, that's entirely a matter for you. But I think the really important thing is that those people who do choose to honour the war dead are allowed to do so in, in peace and with the necessary respect and solemnity. Totally agree. Colonel Richard Kemp, former commander of the British Forces in Afghanistan, thank you for your thoughts on that. Christopher on Twitter says 11th and 12th marches. These are the marches on, well, I think the march is going to be on the 11th uh, this Saturday. Uh, need, to, need to be banned for a distance of two miles from the cenotaph. The police will need to be backed up by the military. Because make no mistake, says Christopher, the supporters of Hamas and Hezbollah will seek the most publicity possible by disrupting Armistice Day. Well, that is uh, not what Ben Jamal, who's the director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, who's behind this march, has said. He's uh, got a long statement, maybe I'll just read a little bit more of it. He says, given the wider context of the previous statements by the Home Secretary seeking to demonise all of those marching in support of the rights of the Palestinian people, it is clear these comments are in reality motivated by a desire to suppress widespread public support for an end to Israel's bombardment of the people of Gaza. No words from him about Hamas terrorism there and the bombardment of the people of Israel. Maybe maybe just, maybe that was, is it at the end of it? Oh, oh no, he hasn't mentioned that. Right, that's quite strange. Um, very odd. Uh, those marching are united in their belief that the violence should stop in international law which prohibits the targeting and killing of civilians be respected to suggest that undertaking protests well away from Whitehall is disrespectful, for, dis disrespectful of the war dead as an insult to those marching for peace says uh, Ben Jamal who is director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Well my ace producer Ryan has made the phone call to ask Mr Jamal to come on the programme if he will before the end of the programme I will happily interview him about a statement and I would be very interested to ask him whether he thinks Hamas are terrorists and whether they are uh, whether we should be uh, having the full force of the law against them in international law. Let's talk to Barry in Kent he's given me a ring on 0344 499 1000. Barry you're very welcome to the programme what would you like to say? Good afternoon, Peter. Nice to speak to you in a great show. Thank you. Thank you. What's your point, Barry? 
Uh, so basically, I'm just fed up with all this business going on in this country with letting, you know, these people, uh, uh, you know, protest on our streets, uh, supporting a attack on a country that wasn't at war with anybody. Yeah. Um, and now it's created a situation that everyone now is now walking around on eggshells. We have a police commissioner that cannot get a grip on anything. We have a police force that doesn't enforce the law. We now have people, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, potentially going to disrupt our celebration. They say they won't. Ben Jamal, the director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, says it won't be until afterwards. It's not until 12.45. So um, we we all need to calm down and it's not going to be an issue. Well, it's it's going to be an issue because you're going to have... It's a bit like a football game. If you have two lots of supporters, that there is a form of hatred at some point amongst those supporters... Um, and they are within miles of each other. Yeah. It's going to be an issue because you're going to have v- veterans that are very for this country, mm. and, and like myself, I- I'm fed up with this country allowing people um, that are not born and bred here, and they're on the streets, and all they're doing is disrupting our everyday life, and we need to get a grip because this country is now... We're an easy we're an easy ticket to come here, mm. and this government and governments of the past have allowed this. Okay, and it's about time now that we stood up for our country. We have people in power that stood up for our country, not meeting with Elon Musk. You know, when there's a potential war knocking on our door. I, th- I, think, I think that's a I think that's a very fair point, Barry. Um, I think a lot of people will say, "Hold on a second, is AI as important as all of this?" Although Rishi Sunak has put a statement out, in fairness uh, to him, we're going to talk about Zara Alina's killer, Jordan McSweeney, winning a sentencing appeal, and more about this issue on Remembrance Day. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> so, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, Spaniards. you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. and We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm-hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem solved. solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle <laughs> class. Us here, Tess. But I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after <laughs> this now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. 
How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon, I'm Zora Suleiman. The leader of the Lebanese terrorist group Hezbollah has blamed the United States for what's happening in Gaza, saying Israel is only a tool and America is using it. Hassan Nasrallah's Iranian-backed group is fighting the Israeli army on the country's borders. Well, Israel has warned Lebanon that if it tests them, then it'll pay dearly. Meanwhile, the U.S. Secretary of State has called for pauses in the fighting in talks with the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Antony Blinken is also visiting Jordan as he tries to avert an escalation of the war. As Israel conducts his campaign to defeat Hamas, how it does so matters. It matters because it's the right and lawful thing to do. It matters because failure to do so plays into the hands of Hamas and other terror groups. There will be no partners for peace if they're consumed by humanitarian catastrophe. A shopping centre security officer will stand trial next June, accused of an alleged plot to kidnap and murder former This Morning presenter Holly Willoughby. Gavin Plum from Harlow in Essex has denied any involvement. The 36-year-old is also accused of encouraging another person to travel to the UK to carry out the attack. Parts of the UK are feeling the after effects of Storm Kieran, with more than 70 flood warnings still in place across England. The south coast and the Channel Islands were battered with winds of up to 100 miles per hour yesterday, and the extreme weather is now moving to Scotland and parts of northern England. Talk TV weather presenter Joe Wheeler says flooding is the issue. All that water that did fall with Kieran is still leaking into the waterways and needs to, to run off. But then on top of that, we've got showers around today, particularly over uh, eastern parts of England, the northeast parts of eastern Scotland. In fact, more of a band of rain moving across eastern Scotland, which is an area at the moment which is incredibly sensitive. A man has been banned from dressing as a gimp and writhing, crawling or wriggling around on the floor. Joshua Hunt was convicted last week of two cases of terrifying female motorists late at night near Western Supermare. But police have linked him to 25 incidents. The 32-year-old gardener denies the outfit was a gimp suit. A study has found nearly two-thirds of people believe politicians invent or exaggerate so-called culture war issues. Around half said anti-woke topics are being used as a distraction. Researchers at King's College London say inflation, the NHS and immigration are the issues that matter most to voters. Well, that's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, the weather stays unsettled over the weekend with a new storm pushing through and further showers to come. For the time being, Storm Kieran has moved off into the North Sea, the uh, low pressure system just off the coast there, and we've got some rain making its way westwards across Scotland. So, again, a yellow warning for eastern parts where we've seen so much heavy rain recently. Elsewhere, we're looking at sunshine and showers, some of those heavy, particularly down towards the southeast. And the day isn't warm. Temperatures around 8 or 9 degrees Celsius in the north, down to around 11 or 12 in the south. And then as we go overnight, while well, this rain over Scotland starts to become more showery as it pushes its way westwards, 
We'll see further showers pushing their way in from the northwest, and then they die out as the next area of cloud, wind, and rain moves into the southwest. Now, it will be quite a chilly night under clear skies. Temperatures in the towns and cities single figures, in rural areas lower still. And whilst it remains blustery around the coasts, winds fall flat across central and northern parts with some mist and fog. And then through the course of Saturday, the wet and windy weather moves across much of England and Wales, followed by some showers. Again, these could be heavy at times and it's not very warm. Temperatures 9 to 12 degrees Celsius at best. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Well, very good afternoon, Peter Cardwell here. If you're just joining me, there's another hour of this show. Uh, maybe you have been uh, joining us for the last hour. We've discussed loads of things, including the Remembrance Day service and the fact that there may well be, well, there will be a protest by a pro-Palestinian march in London the same day. We'll get to that in a second, but there is outrage as those activists are set to march through the streets of London. The same day, the 11th of November, the same day the Festival of Remembrance is going to be at the Royal Albert Hall, where protesters have descended on the capital in support of Palestine over the last three Saturdays. It's going to continue on Remembrance Day itself, the 11th of November. In the last few hours, the Prime Minister has condemned the march, calling it provocative. Is he right, or should we allow the protests to go ahead? Should, she, should he allow it to go ahead? We've also had a statement from Ben Jamal, who is the director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, saying, nothing to worry about here. The march will begin at around 12.45, nearly two hours after the minute silence of commemoration for the war dead. Given these facts, we are deeply alarmed, Mr Jamal says, by members of the government, including the Prime Minister issuing statements suggesting the march is a direct threat to the cenotaph. So he denies that. We've a call in with him if he says he'll come on in the next hour or indeed on my Saturday and Sunday show between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. both days. I will speak to Mr. Jamal and I will ask him about that. Also this afternoon, tensions continue to rise in the Middle East itself as the leader of the terrorist group Hezbollah has said that they're in a true battle, as he puts it, with Israel and he is ready for all possibilities. He also says the Hamas attacks on the 7th of October were a glorious jihadi operation. Uh, those are the words of the head of Hezbollah. Those are not my words. I would call it a horrendous, terrorist, murderous attack. With the US Secretary of State Anthony Blinken in Tel Aviv, are we on the verge of a white war in the Middle East? That's uh, something we have been discussing discussing with Tobias Elwood earlier in the programme and we'll continue to discuss over the course of the next hour. And are you tired after a long week of work? Well, fear not, your job could soon be overtaken by artificial intelligence bots. Elon Musk made the sinister claim during a cosy fireside chat with Rishi Sunak. Do you fear technology could be coming for your job? Let us know. The number is 0344 499 1000 if you want to talk about this or any other issue we're talking about today or maybe there's something you think we should be talking about. It's my show, but it's your show too. Today and indeed tomorrow on Sunday between 10 and 1. The number is 0344 499 1000 on the phone. It's 7222 on text. Uh, be sure to put the word talk in your text or you can tweet me at talk TV. And that indeed is what Chris on Twitter has done and says if, if uh, Jamal, this is Ben Jamal, comes on your programme and if he's in charge, uh, I think there are actually a number of organisers of the march, so it's not fair just to put it on all of Ben Jamal, but he is certainly one of the organisers. Uh, if he is in charge, says Chris in Twitter, please ask him if he will identify and hand over to police anybody committing crimes of religious hatred, of criminal damage, so as to stick by our rules on our country, showing he does want to assimilate properly and wants others to do so as well. Alfred says, let's be honest Peter, this is Sadiq Khan's prints all over it, as does the manner in which the Met Police have singularly failed to police in an acceptable way, says Alfred. Well, I'm sure Sadiq Khan would deny that. Uh, Mick says, leaders rarely get anything right. The leadership that arranged to do a protest march on the same day as Armistice Day morning is a basic mistake politically. It's an obvious mistake. It shows a complete lack of talent and any political awareness. We had a call from Barry on this just before the news there, and Mark in Norwich says, Barry for PM. We need someone like him as opposed to the immature 
pathetic little toad Sunak. We don't need Sunak to moan and whinge about the protests. We need him to take action to stop them, says Mark in Norwich. Well, just let's just remind ourselves before we go to the next story just what Rishi Sunak has actually said on this uh, march. Um, it's just a couple of paragraphs. I'm going to read it out. Rishi Sunak, Prime Minister, to plan protests and armistice day is provocative and disrespectful, he says, and there's a clear and present risk that the cenotaph and other war memorials could be desecrated, something that would be an affront to the British public and the values we stand for. The right to remember in peace and dignity, uh, Rishi Sunak says, those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice for those freedoms must be protected. I have asked the Home Secretary to support the Met Police in doing everything necessary to protect the sanctity of Armistice Day and remember it Sunday. Well, we will certainly talk about that and the police's role in that as well. That's something that Alfred was talking about in terms of the Metropolitan Police. Well, the Metropolitan Police are under pressure in another way as well. It's really the justice system because Zara Alina's killer, Jordan McSweeney, has won a sentencing appeal. Now, if we just remind ourselves about him, nasty piece of work because he was the person who stalked and then murdered uh, Zara Alina. He's won a Court of Appeal challenge to have his minimum tariff of 38 years reduced. Now, he's only got it down to 33 years, still a lot of time. But nonetheless, why on earth was he on the streets in the first place? He had been released from prison on licence nine days before the murder. He had a string of previous convictions. He admitted murder and sexual assault but refused to attend a sentencing hearing last December when the original tariff and a mandatory life sentence were imposed. And last month he left a Court of Appeal hearing after about 45 minutes. Uh, what a nasty piece of work. And, of course, we remember the, some of the horrendous details. I'll not tell you all of them, obviously, because it's um, 10 past four in the afternoon. I expect children are listening. But the murder occurred nine days after he was released from prison on licence. He was there for robbery. An attempt was made to recall him to prison two days before the murder, according to reports, and suggested he should not have been released in the first place. Now, the police conducted, the Metropolitan Police conducted an internal review after reports were published that he had been convicted 28 times for 69 earlier offences, including nine separate spells in prison, and he ought to have been recalled in the first place. So this was an administrative screw-up by the sound of things. He had a history of violence and abuse. A restraining order was taken out against him. I mean, he is just a nasty, nasty piece of work, and uh, I, I believe he should be in prison for the rest of his life, quite frankly. Let's get the uh, perspective of Helen Fields, who is a former... Uh, criminal law barrister. Um, Helen, you're very welcome to the programme this afternoon. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Hello, Peter. Uh, I mean, this is just another slap in the face for Zara Alina's family, really, isn't it? Um, look, the difference between 38 years in prison and 33 years in prison isn't huge. But at the same time, that's another five years of this scumbag's life that he is getting back and that Zara Alina uh, will never get back. Absolutely. And, and uh, Zara, Alina's family, have behaved in an absolutely impeccable way. What they said is that the uh, reduction by the Court of Appeal of this sentence by five years is disheartening for women. It really is. So not to go into all the technicalities, but just to explain where this reduction comes from, the original judge who gave an absolutely uh, uh, impeccable um, judgment in this case said that one of the aggravating features so the baseline sentence here for this particular serious murder was 30 years on top of that the sentencing judge looks at aggravating and mitigating features and what the original judge took into account was the fact that Zara would have suffered more physically and mentally uh, during the attack and before her death um, and what the Court of Appeal later said, and the reason they reduced the sentence, is because Zara is thought to have become unconscious very early on in the attack, which lasted for some nine minutes. Zara did then, then live for several more hours. Um, uh, but because the attack was nine minutes long, because she looked to be unconscious early on, there was some footage, um, they're saying that uh, the reality is that she could not have suffered more after she was unconscious. So the original judge shouldn't add it or have added on the other years on top of the 30. So they brought it down from 38 to 33 because they said their first judge was wrong about that. Now. That, frankly, is ridiculous. The Court of Appeal normally does a good job with law in this country. I have to say I am completely at odds with them in this case. I think it's ridiculous to say it doesn't matter whether that attack went on for nine minutes mm -hmm. or for nine hours. It doesn't matter. I, I think most people will agree with you. Yeah. It doesn't matter how long. Uh, that poor girl would have known for however many seconds or minutes that what was about to happen to her was that she was likely to be assaulted and then probably killed. And that is as much suffering as the original judge needed to add on the sentence on top of the 30 years to make it up to the 
the 38. And the Court of Appeal have misstepped here because it sends a message to other offenders, mm. however few may they, be, they may be, to say, oh, if you use a, an extreme amount of force and knock your victim unconscious, you can do whatever you like afterwards and it won't be an aggravating factor. I mean, I don't know what the Court of Appeal were thinking in this particular case, but it seems to me that they have really badly misjudged the effect of what they said today. Helen, there's a sort of wider question here. I worked in the Ministry of Justice for six months. I was a special advisor to the former Justice Secretary, Robert Buckland. And I just want to ask you, because I just feel there's so many people, and I certainly felt that even as I was working in the, in the Ministry of Justice, that the, the justice system just lets people down a lot. There is just a lack of faith there. And there is this question that someone who... I mean, there are clearly a huge number of mistakes made here. 28 convictions, 69 earlier offences, uh, horrendous things and why he was out of prison at all in the first place. I mean, someone like this, I think, should be in prison for the rest of their life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the problem is when these, these offences, so let's remind ourselves, he hadn't been convicted of a sexual offence. Yes. And yeah. he hadn't been convicted of any really serious offence of violence. So what he did on this occasion was a serious step up, and the judge noted that from anything he'd done before. And the problem is that what we tend to do in this country is we look at each individual offence, and we the court will look at previous offences, but it's only going to sentence on what's before it. But the reality is with people like McSweeney is that we really need to be paying closer attention to the overall trend in their offending and to look at where they're going. And this was a man, I mean, over the course of the evening before he attacked Zara, he had stalked other women in a terrifying yes. way. Um, so this wasn't, you know, the defence barrister uh, tried to say that it was, wasn't was premeditated, the murder. Um, but clearly there was a pattern happening that evening and he was being very careful. Yes, he was yes. very hard yes. about finding a victim. This wasn't somebody who was overcome by some sort of, no. you know, momentary sense of something he wanted to do. It is a very very violent man. The only thing I would say yeah. about the reduction from 38 to 33 years, that's just the minimum. So after that yeah, period see, of time... It could, it, could, it could be longer and the parole board will, will, will look at that. Helen, thank you very, very much indeed. There's Helen Fields there, who's a former criminal law barrister. I just want to read out one text very quickly here. Uh, Sally in Surrey. Peter, this is something I can't easily talk about, but I need to speak because of the strength of my feelings. The man who murdered my son and his girlfriend was sentenced to a minimum of 30 years. I cannot even apply for parole until that time is served. I do not agree with capital punishment, but I do want that man to serve every single minute and second of his sentence. He also had a string of violent offences behind him, including three other separate non-fatal stabbing offences. The thought of him getting any time off that sentence would be devastating. Best love, Sally and Surrey. My goodness, Sally, well, thank you for telling us your story. We're going to talk to a Labour front bencher, in fact, the, the uh, Shadow Cabinet Office Minister, Nick Thomas-Simmons, next.
We're joined now by Nick Thomas Simmons MP. He is a Shadow Cabinet Office Minister, a very senior Labour Party frontbencher. Uh, Nick, you're very welcome to the programme. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, and good to join you, Peter. Uh, Nick, maybe I could ask you about Keir Starmer. He's been making a speech this afternoon. He wants to bulldoze through barriers to British success. How's he going to do that? Well, listen, I think Keir has been setting out his stall today in advance of the King's speech. And I think what you've seen him talk about today is a real plan to give Britain its future back. Now, let me give you some specific examples of that, whether it is in terms of investment, a national wealth fund, the gigafactories that we need for the green transition to create jobs, not just in the northeast where Keir was speaking, but up and down the country, whether it's in terms of skills. Keir has talked today about further education colleges being able to apply to become specialist technical colleges. We've heard as well about the reform of the apprenticeships uh, levy. Let's make it a growth and skills levy so that people throughout the course of their lives can upskill. And thirdly, and this is what Keir was talking about, bulldozing through problems in our planning system that are preventing us from efficiently building the critical national infrastructure that we need, but also the housing that we need as well. And I thought we saw those messages coming through loud and clear in that speech today. We certainly heard a lot of that uh, similar rhetoric, and I'm sure he's building on that, if you'll excuse the expression, um, certainly uh, what he talked about in his uh, party conference speech uh, three weeks ago. You were there, of course, in Liverpool, as was I, reporting for Talk TV. And um, that, it was a very united Labour Party at that stage. I think there, were, there was barely a cigarette paper between even people like Keir Starmer and uh, even Richard Bergen, someone like that, who's a former uh, shadow uh, Secretary of State under, under Jeremy Corbyn. But now the Labour Party is in a slightly different position, isn't it, on Israel? In fact, we have uh, Burnley and Pendle Council, uh, Labour councillors, uh, saying that Keir Starmer should resign. We have a number of people saying that uh, within the Labour Party uh, disagreeing with him, including some front benchers on Gaza and the ceasefire. It seemed it was all going pretty well for Keir Starmer, but his, his, you cannot argue that the Labour Party is united on Gaza, can you, Nick Thomas-Simmons? Well, well, firstly, in terms of the speech that he's made today, I, I doubt you'd find anyone uh, across the Labour Party who disagreed with the message in Keir Starmer's speech today. I, I agree with you, but on Gaza you're not united, are you? Well, in terms of uh, the position regarding uh, Gaza, there is unity on trying to find a position where there's a cessation of hostilities and a firm commitment to a two-state solution that would mean a safe and secure Israel alongside uh, a viable Palestine. So th th there is unity on those uh, But there's, there's not unity on a ceasefire, and there's lots of people saying there should be a ceasefire, and Keir Starmer saying that there shouldn't be. I actually agree with Keir Starmer. I think he's right. But your party is not united. Well, on, on, on the issue of a ceasefire, as Keir set out in the speech he gave at Chatham House earlier in the week, the problem with a ceasefire at this stage would be it would be to leave Hamas in a position where Hamas, a terrorist organisation that committed this terrible atrocity on the 7th of October, would still have uh, hostages and they would still have the capacity to launch an attack like that again. And by the way, we've, hear, we've heard Hamas saying that that's what they would do again. But, but you don't so need to convince me, Nick thomas Simmons. I agree with everything you're saying. Why can't Keir Starmer convince people in his own party? You agree with him, but many, many hundreds of people in the Labour Party do not. Because because there are people, and I've spoken to people, whether it's, you know, not just parliamentary colleagues, Peter, but, but people, members of the party, councillors, and, and, and indeed others. I've spoken to someone who visited uh, a kibbutz only a matter of weeks ago that was then targeted by Hamas when a family that they visited uh, was attacked. I speak to people who have family in Gaza who are extraordinarily worried, obviously, about them. So I think these lived connections that we've got mean, of course, that people take a very strong view on this. And what Kia has been doing has been listening to those opinions, then making judgments. And I think that listening he's been doing, that com the conversations he's been having, is a very, very important part of his leadership on this. In terms of the march that the uh, pro-Palestinian organisations that have been marching in London are saying will happen on the 11th of November, Rishi Sunak's 
perhaps it, it would appear he suggests su suggesting thinking about banning it or doing something uh, perhaps to the, the organisation themselves have given us a statement saying that it's actually not going to interfere with the Cenotaph uh, and what happens at the Cenotaph on the 11th or the 12th. Would Labour ban that parade? Look, I, I'm in favour of the right to protest, but I do support the police in protecting our cenotaphs and our Remembrance Day parades up and down the country. I'm very proud to lead them here in Torvine uh, every year as the Member of Parliament. I was a regular attender for years and years before that. Uh, as someone local here who wanted to pay their respects, they are moments when the communities come together and gathering at the cenotaph is central to what we do to remember all those people of previous generations and the current generations and indeed our veterans as well i, I, I i'm sure lots of people will have a lot of sympathy with that nick but just just to be clear labor wouldn't ban this parade if you were in government labor would be standing with the police in making absolutely sure that whether it's the Cenotaph on Whitehall, which is obviously where our national act of remembrance is, or whether indeed it's Cenotaphs in any other town, city or village of the country, would be protected so that people are able to come together and have that act of remembrance without being disturbed. That's the position that Labour would take in government. Uh, just on the point of Keir Starmer and indeed Remembrance Sunday, he was be, he's been criticised uh, for failing to wear a poppy when filming a video message about Islamophobia. He wore one earlier in the day. Uh, we've been told that was a mistake. Is that right? Yes, yeah, it's just not. That, that's just not a, a, a deliberate thing. And I think we've, we, you know, in terms of this uh, debate, you know, I've known Keir Starmer for for many many years. Not not only since he's. Uh, been a, become a member of parliament he's very very proud uh, to wear the poppy uh, as am I as a as we are right uh, right across the uh, right across the Labour Party. Um, we had some breaking news in the last few minutes the Conservative MP Bob Stewart has been found guilty of racially abusing an activist he told him to and I quote go back to Bahrain. Now, Bob Stewart is the Beckenham MP, South East London. He told a man called Saeed Ahmed uh, al Wadi, you're taking money off my country, go away, during a row outside the Foreign Office's Lancaster House in uh, it's December uh, 14. And uh, he said, go away, I hate you, you make a lot of fuss, go back to Bahrain. Uh, Bob Stewart has been found guilty of this. Um, what is your reaction to that, Nick Thomas-Simmons? Well, I'm, I'm deeply disturbed to, to hear about that. I think we have to trust our legal process if there's been a guilty finding. I'd obviously expect the Conservative Party to act accordingly on that basis. OK. Um, and Nick, just one more thing, actually. There was a, a, a... Just on Gaza, if we can sort of pivot back to that just for a second. Um, the Labour Party called the other day for a disastrous emergency committee appeal to be set up with matched government funding for aid to Gaza. I just wonder if that's actually a good idea, because we had an aid expert on this programme yesterday saying that actually some of that money might end up in the hands of Hamas. I just wonder how is best to help people, and I mean the innocent civilians, of course, in Gaza at the moment. Right, well, well, just two things. Firstly, the Disaster Emergency Committee has, has, you know, that mechanism, if you like, has raised huge amounts of money, whether it's for Ukraine, whether it's for Afghanistan. And of course, the government, out of a contingency fund, can match fund it. So in terms of raising the money, I'd argue it's extremely effective, as experience has shown. The second point, uh, Peter, which is around making sure that the aid that does go into Gaza stays at the hands of Hamas, clearly we've got to work, whether it's with uh, international groups, with NGOs, with, with the government of Egypt, to make sure that we, we do our best to ensure that doesn't happen. That was a concern, for example, that was uh, raised about supplies of fuel. So we have but, to... But isn't it inevitable? I mean, Hamas controlled Gaza. Isn't it inevitable, Nick? It, it, it's not inevitable if we are able to ensure we get the humanitarian pauses that we've called for and indeed the aid agencies that are able to operate properly to ensure that things are getting directly uh, to the people who need that assistance. I know uh, Tuesday is a big day on the parliamentary calendar. It is, of course, the King's speech. I know that uh, Keir Starmer's speech that we talked about at the very start of the interview was really a, a sort of ramping up what Labour would do in that regard. Uh, have you any confidence that the government has any ideas in the King's speech that, that uh, King Charles will read out that will make the country better? Well, I was watching the Prime Minister's interview yesterday and he seemed to be 
angling for his next job over in the United States rather than focusing on the job that he should actually be doing. And my impression of this government really is that it's chronically run out of ideas and it's run its course. And of course, Peter, I'll be making the argument over however many months are left until the general election that it's time for a change. Nick, thank you very, very much indeed. That's Nick Thomas Simmons there as the Shadow Minister for the Cabinet Office, Labour from Bencher. Thank you to him. Uh, if you want to react to anything that Nick Thomas Simmons has been saying there, give us a shout, 0344 499 1000. We're also going to be talking to about Elon Musk a little bit later on. He was referencing there the sort of AI stuff that Rishi Sunak was saying, saying that people should be, uh, don't don't necessarily want the security of a paycheck. I know I, know I do, um, to be brutally frank. Um, Joe in Belfast has been in touch, says, uh, Hello Peter, yet another issue regarding our judicial system. This is in regard to uh, what we are talking about a little bit earlier, that horrendous uh, murder, the sentencing of that horrible, horrible man who uh, has been, uh, his sentence has gone down from 38 to 33 years, Jordan McSweeney, he was the killer of Zara Alina. So Joe has been in touch. Uh, yet another issue regarding our judicial system. I do not advocate the death penalty. However, like you, some crimes should carry a life sentence, meaning a full life term. That monster is one. I will remember it Sally and her husband in a wee prayer, how brave they are, but how sad Sally messaged us in as well about her family and what happened there. And Zara Alina's family, I think uh, Joe would agree, and many, of, I'm sure everybody would agree, have been incredibly dignified in all of this. Uh, on the protest itself, uh, Sue in, uh, Susan, sorry, I should say, in Lytham St. Anne's, great part of the world, says, why don't they give it a rest? Those who want to protest should be given the opportunity to have two pro to protest a year. They should not be allowed in an inner city. These protests should, be, uh, should not be affecting trade in the shops. Tourists want to enjoy their time, says Susan in Lytham St Anne's. Um, Sean has said the police are not going to stop the protest. They all have a right to march at any time, Peter, uh, says Sean and Durham. Most of them will be Brits. You cannot stop it. Uh, we'll have a range of views on that. Um, Terry uh, has been in touch on Nick Thomas Simmons, typical politician, he didn't answer any of your questions. Um, so there we are, that was uh, Terry's view on Nick Thomas Simmons. Uh, Dawn in Chelmsford says, Peter, there is a danger that any attack on war memorials or statues will inflame tensions. The far right is already in France and Germany and the UK could well be next. This is serious. Well, we'll take all more of your calls, texts and tweets after the break here on Talk TV. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you conquer time. Who that wins? Happens. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? I'm so <laughs> rich. <laughs> uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis Sanz? No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yes. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. But I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying <laughs> this now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs>
got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question. You answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV. It's not only the home of common sense. It's the only place where you get the truth. Thanks everybody for getting in touch. Lots of people with lots of different opinions. Alex and Devon says on messages, I think anybody that disrupts Armistice or Remembrance Weekend should have their British benefits withdrawn permanently. Food for thought. Uh, Dormston Cook in Worcester says if they do, or more importantly allowed to do this, then be prepared for anarchy to ensue. This is our National Remembrance Day where I can remember the man I looked after for many years uh, jumping off the first barge to land on a gold beach in 1944. My goodness. Um, and thank you as well to Alison in Suffolk. He says, I do hope the protest does not disrupt the Remembrance Day parades. I am ex-military, and I remember leaving one parade, turning on the radio to hear that Inniskillen had had a bomb that was in Northern Ireland that was IRA terrorists who killed many people there at the Poppy Day bomb. I, I think it was 1989, if I remember off the top of my head. Uh, it was devastating. Uh, we must also remember that there are many children who are on these parades, scouts, guides, etc. I hope we are left to remember peacefully. Alison, I agree with you. I was a member of the Boys' Brigade and uh, went to our uh, Remembrance Day parade in our village, actually, uh, for many, many years. And, uh, of course, I remember now I live in London as well. Uh, JK in Lancashire says, no demos of any kind allowed over that weekend, especially by people who don't respect our country or the dead who make uh, a demonstrating possible. They don't know the words disappear Discipline or decency. They usually praise the hellholes that house their fanatics and would be happier amongst them. Uh, Nicholas says, I salute Colonel Kemp's ability not to openly fume on this topic. Your interview says much that needs saying, yet should not have to be reminded. Uh, Nicholas, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's disgraceful. Um, and a final message from Derek in Newhall in Derbyshire says, the uh, route for Remembrance Sunday should be manned with armed soldiers uh, with orders to shoot anyone who dares to break through the lines. It is abhorrent that these morons are even allowed to hold such a protest on the same day, says Derek. Well, I don't want anybody further to die, Derek, I must say, and I'm sure the military and the police will try their very best to keep it as safe as possible. But, of course, a lot of people just do not have that level of... Uh confidence in the police. Uh, Raga is in Glasgow. Uh, thank you for your call, 0344 499 1000. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Yeah, yeah, it's okay, Raga, Raja, it's all the same, brother. Go for it. Uh, what, is your, what are your thoughts on this uh, Remembrance Day uh, march? Right. Right, the simple thing is my, my father and a lot of Indians with the Raj, you know, that was in the, in the Indians and Muslims. Yes, everybody, yes. everybody fought for Britain, so my dad fought for freedom, and thank God we got it. Now, my only point, if you can let me make two points. First point is the, that if, if the remembrance day can happen, then I'm sure we can do something for Palestine. I hope that they won't interrupt it, I know that. But hopefully they don't, and we, and we will keep a minute silent. Well, what makes you so confident that it won't be interrupted, that there won't be any disruption that day? Because we do have the statement saying, like, it's not happening until later, it's not happening until a quarter to one, but there will be people coming in for the march and so on. I mean, are you? Uh, what makes you so confident that things will be OK? Listen, I'm, I'm not going to say it's, you always get one bad apple on a tree. Of course you do. Something will happen. But, 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 but And then let me come back in after the talk about this point. But, but what I'm saying is this... Let it be. This country, we're, we're, we're all multi races we, we should be a multi together. We should Muslims, Catholic, Jews. We're all one. We're all human beings. We all breathe the same. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, listen, let let be, let be. Any idiots, I'm sure the police will arrest them. And my other point is, before you uh, answer this one, please. OK, go, go, go. sorry, your second point? You want to make another point? Right, my second point is that everybody keeps saying Hamas, which is a horrible, but I don't like them, I hate them, right? But my second point is, people keep saying Hamas are holding hostages. What about the children 
that Israel have been holding and, and Israel have been, have, uh, have been jailing for the last, I don't know, 40, 50 years. Well, listen, why, we, we why, can talk about... let them go? But, Raga, with respect, that, that's, that's what about her? What about this? What about that atrocity? What about this? I mean, the fact is that mothers grandmothers, children were taken from their beds and there are 239 hostages in Gaza. Which is horrible. It's horrible. It shouldn't have happened. But why are they allowed to take children and, and nobody talks about their hostages? I mean, I, I know you're going to cut me off now. I know I'm not going to cut you uh, off. I'm just simply well, going well, 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 to well, say... answer that question? And what, what about kids at 7, 8 years of old, 12 years of old? And Brian, you... you in Britain, thank God, my father, my, because that's a free country, and saying nothing will happen on Saturday, I can promise you. A couple of idiots, yes. But the only thing is, the bias from a lot of, especially a few media, is why are their children allowed to suffer in uh, Israeli well, well, jails, and yet, do you know hostages or no? Raga, I am I am not someone who says that Benjamin Netanyahu is the you know is 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 as pure as the driven snow. I don't think that everything the Israeli government or everything the Israeli military has done over the years has been good. I don't think they have necessarily helped themselves a lot of the time, and I think they have done things that they shouldn't have done. But what is absolutely clear to me, and I think actually it is clear to you as well, Raga, is that Hamas terrorists are awful, horrible people who started what have gone on, what has gone on. There is context, of course, there is, but they started on the seventh of October. Things were pretty peaceful, things were pretty stable and then they started things up again and we need to remember that Of course I do that, I was crying my friend I was crying because I've got I've got Catholic friends I've got Jewish friends, I've got every day I watch these news but my heart breaks but, but, but the only problem what I've got is uh, why don't they just they just stop all this and the other thing is uh, when Israel Nathalie Howe told everybody to go to the south of Gaza and then now the south of Gaza getting bombed. Well, well there, just, there, just, there just wasn't enough time for them to get out of harm's way. So I, th I think that's a very good point, oh, actually. Right, right. Raga. I, 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 brilliant, mate. Brilliant. You know what? Honestly, I, I, you, you're just covering for Israel's crimes now. Yeah? I'm, not, I'm not covering for... I've, I've, I've literally... I, Raga, Raga, I've literally just said that I don't think that... Uh, I think there is a lot to criticise Benjamin Netanyahu on. I think there's a lot to criticise the Israel, Israeli government on it. I've let you have your say, and, and yet you're saying I'm making excuses for the Israelis. Yeah, I don't think I am. Yeah, 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 yeah of course. Yeah, you, you just, you know, oh, they never got time to get there. So, so No, no, I'm saying... No, hold on, hold on. You've got to, you've got to listen no, no. to what... Raga, Raga, sorry. I've let you have your say. You've got to let me have my say. What I'm saying is that I was actually criticising Israel and saying that when they said for 1.1 million people to move from the north of Gaza to the south of Gaza, they did not give them enough time to get out of harm's way. So I'm actually agreeing with you on that point. Raga, I, I, I hope you've, you agree you've had your say. We're going to leave it there. Um, feel free to give me another ring at some stage. I will happily have you on again. It is merely because time is pressing on and I want to talk to Tony in Watford who has been uh, waiting patiently. Tony, you're very welcome to the programme. What would you like to say? Thanks very much. Um, I suppose, really, the first of all, total frustration at listening to just about every single politician who will never give you or anybody else an answer. It's sit on the fence time, which has happened again and again. Um, we have freedom of speech in this country, which is, is something that's got to be treasured. And we have to accept that it will be used against us mm. by the likes of Hamas, etc., who um, will manipulate wherever possible. The, the, the real problem, I think, started back in 97, 98, when the three letters IST were weaponized. If you disagree with anything, you were an ist, a bit of sexist, a racist, whatever it may be. And that has made people like myself, who sit very quietly, seething, um, defensive about saying anything. Mm. However, what happened on the 7th was an atrocity. It's really that simple. I've never understood all this wage that goes on about the Jewish people who are just normal people. But what we saw and what we heard was appalling. Now, of course, the narrative is being pushed that uh, it's now, you know, the, the people in Gaza, etc. Well, yes, it's appalling. I can't watch children suffering. I hate it. But um, uh, once again, the, the Hamas are using it. They're using the human shield. They're stopping people moving. The Israelis have done as much as they can to move people. 
know, have they though? Uh, how, uh, is that is that is that absolutely true? I mean, they, they certainly told people to get out of the north of Gaza. Um, did they have enough time? Is that was that was that reasonable? I agree with the vast majority of what you're saying, Tony. But I'm just not sure if people had enough time to get out. Of, I don't I don't know if anywhere in Gaza is actually safe. Yeah, I don't. I, no, I don't think anywhere in Gaza is safe, or, or indeed in Israel, from what we see. Um, I, I honestly don't know. I suppose my emotions tell me uh, the, the Israeli state did as much as they could um, before they had to start moving in. And yes. Uh, any life lost in any situation is appalling. Yeah, I, I, Tony, I, I agree with 99% of what you're saying. I think you make a lot of very good points there. Thank you for that. There's lots more to discuss on this issue. We're going to talk more about it after the break, and we're also going to talk about Elon Musk and Rishi Sunak and some of the things that they've been saying. Could I, AI be coming for your job? I certainly hope not with mine. <laughs> Stay with us. Thank you to Paul, who says, uh, Peter, how can it be that in 2023 we are going to allow a march on Britain's most important day by people who want to provoke trouble? Well, I'm, I'm sure not every single person on that march wants to do that. Some of them do, but I'm sure a lot of them are very peaceful. Uh, these ideas don't care about our country and our values. These are going to create, they're going to create a tinderbox. The police should go in hard and send a message multiculturalism has failed, says Paul in Cornwall. Amanda has also pointed out a story I wasn't aware of, but now I am. Labour-run council has cancelled the annual Remembrance Day Parade. Barry Council, this is in Wales, due to health and safety concerns. I've read about this and uh, it's for forced, it says, to cancel its Remembrance Day Parade due to health and safety concerns. Um, a couple of years ago, to the, well, a few more than a few years ago, 2018, uh, an army veteran suffered serious head injuries when he was hit by a car while marshalling the parade. 
I mean, if, if it, I, I, that's horrible, and I'm sorry that guy that happened to that guy. If a council cannot just close a few roads and properly keep people safe during a Remembrance Day service, what's the point of the council? I'm sorry, that is flipping outrageous. Amanda, I, 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 I mean, thank you for your text. I wasn't aware of that. I've looked it up online during the break there. Absolutely ridiculous, uh, Barry Council. Anyway, um, uh, Phil says on, on Twitter as well, veterans fought against fascism, not for it. That is what we are getting, says Phil. Um, I want to talk to Rohit Talwar in a minute. He's a futurist. Um, I, but first I want to listen to Elon Musk speaking to Rishi Sunak yesterday. This is at Bletchley Park at the Artificial Intelligence Summit. The thing that, the thing that comes up most, actually, is, is probably not so much the stuff we've been talking about, but jobs. It's right. what does AI mean for my job? Yeah. Is, is it going to mean that I don't have a job or my kids are not going to have a job? What would your... Kind of observation be on on AI and the impact on labour markets and people's jobs and how they should feel about that as they as they think about this. Well, I think we are seeing the most disruptive force in history here. Um, you know, where we have for the first time, we will have for the first time something that is smarter than the smartest human. Um, and that, I mean, it's hard to say exactly what that moment is, but but there will come a point where no job is needed. You can have a job if you want to have a job for sort of personal satisfaction, but the AI will be able to do everything. So I don't know if that makes people comfortable or uncomfortable. It I mean, it makes me pretty uncomfortable, Elon, to be honest. Uh, Rishi Sunak also said during that encounter that he wants people to be willing to give up the security of a regular paycheck and be comfortable with failure. Rishi, really? I mean... You, you've got family wealth of hundreds of millions of pounds, I think. I, I mean, I don't want to give up the security of a regular paycheck. Call me old-fashioned, and I, I don't want to be comfortable with failure. I want to be comfortable with success. Um, call me old-fashioned. Anyway, let's talk to a futurist. Rohit Talwar is with us. Uh, Rohit, what do you make of what Elon Musk and indeed Rishi Sunak said at this AI conference? I, well, I think Musk is right in the sense that AI will keep evolving. We don't really know quite how fast it will evolve, but if you look at um, ChatGPT as the kind of watershed moment, November 30th last year, most people on the planet hadn't heard of it or generative AI the day it, it is moving very, very quickly though, and some people feel they're being left behind. And when you have all this stuff about oh, well, you know, the, the worst-case scenario stuff. I think a lot of people are, are rightly quite concerned because we have politicians saying, oh, no, there are great possibilities, but then others saying, well, you may lose your job or there may be a nuclear attack. Right, and we don't know how quickly we'll get to the point that Musk was talking about, which is artificial general intelligence that is smart as humans in every regard, or the next stage, which is artificial superintelligence, where it is smarter than us. And what we don't know is what that will look like. It's very hard to think about something that's smarter than us and how it will respond it's, to humans. I, I honestly, I don't think but it's I that, think that hard to think of someone who's smarter than me, to be honest, Rohit. Yeah, we, we will create new jobs. I think we've got to think about human ingenuity that has seen us through all sorts of challenges over many, many centuries. We will come up with jobs that we haven't thought of before that AI could do, but humans will want to. You and I might decide we're going to go off and turn our hobbies into jobs like making furniture or painting or whatever. So I think um, it, it's easy to be doom and gloom about this. As for Sunak, um, yeah, I think the idea of telling a population to be comfortable with not earning and, you know, being in hardship is, is brave of him to say it, but it's also weak policy making because... It, it, we can do things about that. For example, I can see a day when governments take the ownership of AI into public hands and then pay a rent, you know, mm. a commission, if you like, back to the companies that created it and then use the profits that are being generated by that AI to support society. We created effectively a guaranteed basic income 
for nine million people during the pandemic. So it is. Yeah, possible. well, that's 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 a fair point, and I think a wider debate, Rohit, which I'd like to have with you um, at some stage in the future. Rohit Talwar, thank you, uh, feature us there talking about the AI summit. Thank you, to Rohit. We will get him on again, but I just want to bring in uh, just one more call before we go, which is Bob in Ludlow. And uh, Bob, I, I noticed we get a little sort of sentence about what people want to say, and uh, we have many people who wanted to get in today. But I think you make a really, really good point, and it's about what we're not talking about. So, Bob, you're very welcome. What are we not talking about that we should be talking about? Well, as an ex-soldier, I'm just wondering why nobody's talking about the Ukraine war anymore. Has it become less sexy or something? Well, I think we've been overwhelmed by what's happening in Gaza and the Middle East, but we should talk about the Ukraine. And the good news for you, Bob, is that we're going to do that with Mary Dijewski over the weekend. I'm on uh, tomorrow on Sunday between 10 o'clock and 1 o'clock. And I'd love you to listen to that and maybe even ring in again and let us know what you think. But maybe briefly you could tell us now what you think we should be talking about in regard to Ukraine. What was the detail that you've been following that perhaps others haven't that you think we should know about? Well, I mean, basically, um, when you take into account Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, Russia, China, they're all linked. And basically, if a war does, if if an extended war from what you've got between Israel and Hamas and Russia and Ukraine does kick off, Mm. then basically, if Hezbollah, the, the likelihood is that if anybody's going to kick off now, it's going to be Hezbollah. Although they did, they, the leader of Hezbollah did indeed say today that, I mean, we thought we thought he was, he was probably going to say we're joining the war. He said they'd do anything that was necessary in their regard, but it didn't go as far, perhaps, as we thought he would. No, but he has called for action against the US. Yeah. And the, and the thing is, Hezbollah are backed by Iran financially yeah. and militarily. Do you think Hamas are as well, Bob? Well, it's, it's a side swipe, isn't it? Because Hamas are backed by Hezbollah. Yeah. So they're not directly funded or whatever by Iran. But Hezbollah are. So, so basically, if Hezbollah kick off... Israel's going to be fighting a war on two fronts. Yeah. USA is just automatically going to kick in, mm. and they're going to go for Iran. It's a they're terrifying... For th- Iran, th- yeah. then Russia kicks in on Iran's side. It's also possibly China to support Russia, it's, which it, means basically you could easily wind up with a third world war in a very short space of time. Well, that is a very positive thought to end the programme on, uh, Bob. Uh, possibly mutually assured destruction in a uh, nuclear scenario of World War III. Uh, we're, we are going to talk about, as I said to Bob, about Ukraine. We're going to talk about Kosovo. Uh, we're going to talk about lots of other foreign affairs stories that have been missed with Mary Dijewski. She is going to be on my show. I can't remember if it's tomorrow or Sunday, but it's one of the two. I'm here between 10 and 1 tomorrow and on Sunday. Thank you to everybody behind the glass who has made the last week possible. I'll see you hopefully tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, Saturday morning. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah! <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the Preservation of the Habitat of the Lesser Spotted New. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's, it's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is our, where is our 